How's it going American History 2 students? This is Mr. Bell coming at you with another video lesson. We're winding down this crazy COVID-19 semester. Uh, this will be your next to last video, I believe, uh, as far as this school year is concerned. So let's get into it. American History 2 uh, warm up. Didn't give a specific day on this one. Uh, COVID-19 shut down 40, however. What was My Lai? My Lai was a massacre by the United States military in a village in Vietnam where many women and children were killed. The men were people who were fighting in the VC, the Southern uh, Communist Vietnamese Army, the VC being the Viet Cong, and Lieutenant Cali ordered that his men go in there and commit horrific acts towards these people at the My Lai village. What destabilized Cambodia? Two things, the Kramer Rouge Socialist Party and the bombings by Richard Nixon. What gave President unlimited power during the war in Vietnam? Gulf of Tonkin Resolution allowed LBJ and Nixon to send new troops at will without approval from Congress. What was the turning point of Vietnam? The Tet Offensive in which the embassy was lost in Saigon and this is when Lyndon B. Johnson decided he wouldn't run for re-election in January of 68. So, My Lai is an American mass massacre toward innocents in Vietnam. What destabilized Cambodia, Kramer Rouge, and Nixon's bombings. The third one, Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. And the last one, Tet, T-E-T, -T, Tet Offensive. So, let's go ahead and get into our lesson today. It covers Johnson through Carter. We skip 7-1 and 7-2 because it's stuff that we covered. It goes like Teddy Roosevelt through JFK, and we covered all that stuff. So we're going to go Johnson through Carter here and cover this stuff. Some of it we will not cover because it's already been covered in previous lessons. Linda B. Johnson's a Democrat. He was JFK's vice president. Kennedy's assassinated November 22, 1963. Lyndon B. Johnson is sworn in as the next president. He runs for his own term in 64 wins and decides not to run in 68. He is from Texas. His first lady is nicknamed Lady Bird. He loves beagles. He has several beagles who are his pets at the White House, most famously the beagles, him and her. So that is Lyndon B. Johnson, kind of just a overview we covered the Great Society in a previous note session, so there's not much to cover here. We we covered the Medicare, Medicaid part. Remember, Medicare is health care for the elderly. Medicaid is health care for the low income. Uh, people in poverty, don't ever forget that. Make sure you don't mix those up. It also created HUD, which is Housing and Urban Development, which created public housing. Uh, for poor Americans in the United States and the Child Nutrition Act, which guarantees free and reduced lunch for those who qualify, those whose parents make less than a certain amount a year and fall below the poverty line. Johnson's uh, accomplishments, we have covered Civil Rights, Voting Rights Act. Uh, we covered those in the Civil Rights um, we cover those in the civil rights section uh, of our notes, so no need to go back over those. Uh, we covered these in the civil rights section of Vietnam War, Escalation, Credibility Gap, Gulf of Tonkin, Tet Offensives, all been covered. Escalation is him sending more troops to Vietnam using Gulf of Tonkin. Credibility Gap was him lying about the number of Americans dying in Vietnam. The Pentagon Papers reveal that. Gulf of Tonkin is what creates resolution, gives him unlimited control over the United States military uh, during the Vietnam War. And the Tet Offensive is the turning point, the turning point of the Vietnam War where he does not run for re-election after our embassy in Saigon falls. Uh, just to review these, we'll just go ahead and review them. Civil Rights Act outlaws discrimination. Voting Rights Act bans literacy tests. That's what the Selma March uh, was, uh, what the Selma March was for the Voting Rights Act. Uh, TV really hurts his presidency because it is one, he has the first presidency that is under Monday through Friday and Sunday morning coverage uh, via the news. So his decisions are criticized a little more than his predecessors were. He also has to follow JFK. Uh, he's also compared to RFK, who seeks the Democratic nomination even before he resigns. And uh, he 
he he has a mixed legacy because domestically liberals consider him a hero with the great society, but liberals and conservatives and Americans in general consider his actions in Vietnam to be a complete and utter in Vietnam rather excuse me to be a complete and utter failure. So we get to Nixon. Nixon runs saying he's going to restore law and order. We talked about that whenever we uh, covered Nixon in the Vietnam section. He wants to start winning the war in Vietnam. He wants to stop these protests from going on, which is where you get to the Kent State Massacre, in which he is empowered through uh, Schneck versus the USA, where people's First Amendment rights are, that court case says, limited during wartime. He uses that as an excuse to use force to put down protests. And it discourages future protests because people don't want to risk their life. He was the VP for Eisenhower from 52 to 60, runs against Kennedy, has that bad debate on, t- on TV, first televised debate, barely loses to Kennedy. He returns to run in 68. Uh, one of the famous speeches he gives is the Checker speech. And it is over a black and white Cocker Spaniel named Checkers that someone had given his daughter. Uh, His daughter had been wanting a dog, a young daughter at that time. This is when he's vice president for Eisenhower. And it was someone who wanted political favors from him. They were trying to get in good with Richard Nixon by giving his daughter that dog. Uh, He has to come out and defend the gift of that dog. He gives this speech saying that this dog was given as a gift out of compassion and love from a friend. It had nothing to do with his business dealings or his power as vice president and that you can trust him. He wouldn't lie to the American people. Of course, this was the first of many famous lies he would tell to the American people. Stagflation plagued a lot of his presidency. Uh, Stagnant, of course, means to stay still. Flation means to go up. So that means the economy wasn't growing, but prices were going up. When I say it wasn't growing, new jobs were not being created. And a lot of this had to do with his focus on Vietnam. He was elected by what's called a silent majority. Nobody would ever say they were voting for Richard Nixon, but he won big in 68 and in 72. He would become the first of only two presidents to win 49 of 50 states. Uh, But, of course, not long (laughs) after he wins that in 72, he resigns because of the Watergate scandal. So what is Watergate? Watergate is a nice hotel, a set of hotel, and as well as apartment complexes in Washington, D.C., where many congressmen, congresswomen, congressional staffers stayed when they were in Washington from their home states. And it happened to be in 1972 where the Democratic National Committee had set up their campaign headquarters. Well, Nixon felt that The DNC, Democratic National Committee, who would be uh, bankrolling and organizing the opponent that would run against Richard Nixon in 1972. I think it was McGovern. I got to check this out just to double check myself because it's going to drive me crazy. Uh, Maybe he was VP then. No. Okay, it was McGovern that he defeated. He beat, he beat him with 49 of 50 states. He was afraid that, and you got to understand, Nixon, genius level IQ, but a very paranoid person. He was afraid that the DNC had something on him that would cost him an election that he eventually won with 49 of 50 states. So he planned a break-in to the Watergate Hotel to the Democratic National Committee campaign headquarters and had them break in to the filing cabinets to where they would store information and to look for information on President Nixon. Now they found nothing nor did they have anything but the people he organizes to break into Watergate are caught and detained. Nixon denies all involvement and many people uh stick with Nixon. They think he's telling the truth. Another part of the country is really devised that Watergate does believe that this is a complete lie and Nixon's trying to cover this up. Now, I'm giving you the brief overview here, so keep in mind there's a lot more to this than what I'm telling you, but if you want to do more investigating in the Watergate like Woodward and Bernstein did, you can. 
Um, I would go over this probably a lot more in depth. I have a whole big chart I draw out if we were in class, but I'm just trying to hit the as much as I can in the most convenient way during this COVID-19 shutdown. These two reporters don't buy Woodward and Bernstein at the Washington Post. So they began to uh, look in and investigate the Watergate scandal. And they are able to corroborate enough stories, enough sources, uh, to publish the front page headline that Nixon planned the Watergate break-in and that he was lying to the American people about it. Uh, Nixon had everything that was going into the Oval Office was recorded and Nixon uh, had planned the Watergate break-in from the Oval Office. So once the impeachment proceedings, now Nixon was never impeached. He would have been impeached, but he actually ends up resigning. And what happens is he chooses to resign after the U.S. versus Nixon. Congress is demanding the House of Representatives that he turn, off, turn over the tapes. Uh, and he refuses to turn over the tapes, which he was uh, discussing the Watergate break-in with the people he hired to break into the Watergate hotel. Rather, he says he will turn over written transcripts of the tapes. Of course, these could be easily altered, so Congress doesn't accept that. So Congress subpoenas the tapes, meaning they demand that it be uh, used as evidence uh, in an impeachment trial. And the Supreme Court has to decide whether or not Nixon has what's known as executive privilege, which is what Nixon claims. Executive privilege is the right of the president to keep something private if it's an issue of national security. Nixon claims that those tapes have issues of national security on them. Therefore, they cannot be released to the House for an impeachment trial. The Supreme Court rules 7-2 against Nixon, and they demand that he turn over the tapes to the uh, House to begin impeachment proceedings. At this point, Nixon's dead in the water. He knows he is caught red-handed on those tapes. Uh, and Republicans in Congress actually go to Nixon and say, look, you're going to be not only the first president to be impeached by the, the second president at that time, Andrew Johnson was, you're going to be the second president to be impeached by the House, but unlike Andrew Johnson, the Senate is going to convict you because the evidence is right here on tape. And Nixon steps down, and his vice president, Ford, takes over. Now, Ford, coincidentally enough, was actually Nixon's second choice for VP. His first was VP was actually a gentleman named Spiro Agnew, who resigned during Nixon's presidency before Watergate uh, due to uh, some tax fraud. We talked about Nixon in Vietnam earlier, Vietnamization, turnover, uh, the Vietnam War to the people in Vietnam fighting against the Vietnamese and the VC. Uh, he visits China and Russia. Linkage, linkage is improving relationships with Soviet China, sorry, <laughs> Soviet Russia and Communist China under Mao and seeing if they then can get a better handle on things in Vietnam. He ramps up bombings. Cambodia destabilizes it as covered in earlier warm ups. The Kent State shooting, in which he orders the military to go onto the Kent State camp campus to end those protests, and four end up dead in Ohio. All this was covered in the Vietnam section. The ironic thing is, we did kind of start to win in Vietnam, but Nixon didn't get to carry out his bombing campaigns because of Watergate and his resignation. Ford becomes president. Ford was the only president never elected. He actually runs in 76 for his what would be his own term, and he doesn't win it. He loses to Democrat Jimmy Carter. Uh, Ford is known for kind of being a klutz. He was clumsy, fell down a lot. He was not well-spoken. Uh, looking back now, many people think he may have had concussions uh, just due to the fact that he was an offensive tackle for the University of Michigan. Uh, some of his policies were win, whip, inflation. Now he said that uh, if Americans would save money and be more responsible, it would make inflation go down. That was actually not the case. Americans needed to spend money to stimulate the economy. Uh, the Helsinki Accord is when he tries to get Eastern and Western Europe to talk during the Cold War. It doesn't work. He pardons Nixon uh, for Watergate. Nixon can uh, then receive no criminal punishment for Watergate. A president gets to pardon 
uh, any one of a federal crime they want to. They usually do it in the last week or two of their last term. And one of the things he does is pardons Nixon, so Nixon never faces any repercussions from Watergate. Jimmy Carter runs for president in 76 as a peanut farmer from Georgia, uh, governor of Georgia, uh, going into this 76 election. And he appeals because he's a genuine human being, he's a good person, and he is a Washington outsider. People are tired of the inside uh, baseball in Washington with the politics, and they want people who had ran at the state level and actually ran states to do uh, things in Washington that they had done for their states. Problem is, good governors don't often translate to good presidents. I think they do more than uh, senators, especially, or even House members do, which House members are rare to go straight from the House to the presidency. Uh, but four of the five next presidents will be former governors, starting with President Carter. So, Carter's presidency is one of the worst in modern history. Uh, the economy continues to sink. One of the big reasons is the OPEC crisis. Uh, the OPEC crisis is when OPEC, a group of uh, a group of Arab nations in the Middle East who control the price of oil, refuse to refuse to uh, keep the price of oil at a reasonable level when. President Carter did not support uh, the Arab nations in a conflict against Israel. So that becomes extremely problematic. Let me feel like I, sorry, I had like a podcast playing in the background there. So that becomes problematic as it means gas prices go up. So the economy is in uh, tor- turmoil and free fall. Inflation is at an all time high. I mean, prices are going up. Employment says, is at an extreme high. Uh, gas prices are going up. Chernobyl happens, which is when a nuclear reactor uh, melts down in Russia. Uh, actually, it's not in Russia. Where's Chernobyl? Ukraine is where Chernobyl's at. Now, what does that have to do with the United States? It kind of has its own Chernobyl with Three Mile Island, in which a nuclear plant in Pennsylvania has a reactor meltdown, and Carter kind of. Uh, doesn't have a good way to deal with that, and he had previously actually pushed for uh, nuclear power. He will get smoked in his bid for re-election because of being perceived as weak and a poor economy. He has uh, one big accomplishment as president. The Camp David Accords is a peace agreement between Egypt and Israel, a major achievement uh, brokering those uh, two powers, those two world powers who have been uh, against each other for so long to come together and actually get along instead of fighting wars. Camp David is the presidential retreat in Maryland. That the president can frequent. He has the leaders of uh, those two countries there for a long time to negotiate that peace agreement. But his presidency is most remembered for the Iranian hostage crisis. This is the incident in which, after the Iranian Revolution, in which the Ayatollah Khomeini took over and seized power in Iran, after Jimmy Carter, after Jimmy Carter had actually asked for his predecessor, the Shah, to step down because that's what the people of Iran wanted. The Shah was a democratic leader, was for uh, capitalism, was for freedom. Uh, not the best person in the world, but a lot better than the dictator and the radical Ayatollah Khomeini would be. He allows the Ayatollah Khomeini to return from exile in Paris, France, to take over power in Iran. As this happens, the embassy, our embassy in Iran, is taken over. And for 444 days, 52 Americans are held hostage. And this will not end until Reagan becomes president and he demands that the hostages be free. Now... There's two views as far as the Iranian hostage crisis and Reagan. Many people believe they f- they freed the hostages because Iran was actually scared of President Reagan. There was also this thing called the Iran-Contra scandal. During this scandal, it was uh, revealed that Reagan had actually traded arms to free those hostages. So he had given Iran weapons to free uh, the Americans there. There was an attempted... Uh, rescue attempt called Operation Desert Eagle in which a marine helicopter crashed and failed to get to Iran to free the hostages. 
that's going to be it for 7.3. You have one more note session left for this semester. That will be 7.4. Colin, there's an image of the Camp David Accords. The 7.4 is uh, conservatism in the Reagan area. Era, excuse me, not area, era. Getting tired here. The Iran hostage situation there. You see the hostages as they were being held in Iran. Uh, the Camp David Accord Agreement, which was one of the biggest foreign policy accomplishments of any president. So for all the uh, bad things that Carter had, this was a significant accomplishment. And Carter, while not a great president, just a genuinely good human being, he is the guy who started Habitat for Humanity. I believe he's 94, and up until the time of this recording is actually uh, still alive. So that's going to do it for 7.3. If you have any questions about this lesson, please email me at bsbell at clevelandcountyschools.org.